Get set for a whole new era in British policing. Top cops tell us that impending spending cuts mean they're having to think the unthinkable. We need to reimagine in policing um, the way in which uh, we're being asked to operate, the demands, the crime have changed substantially. We need to bring in new people uh, with different skills. The end of old-style street patrols, some DIY policing, difficult choices. We'll ask whether the police can get by or not on a reduced budget. Hello there. If October has been a month of arguments about tax credits, get set for November, which will see the government publish its next spending review. It'll be a big moment in Whitehall, but few public services are waiting in more trepidation than the police. Theirs is not a protected budget like health or schools, so the police have to brace themselves for cuts over this parliament of anything from 25 to 40 per cent. Even if they don't turn out to be that deep on the day, the cuts will not involve a little tuck or trim here or there. No, senior police have told Newsnight that we'll be in a whole new era for policing. Nick Hopkins reports. When it comes to policing, we're a romantic lot. We like our bobbies to be on the beat. We want our cops to be out chasing robbers. But those days are coming to an end. Crime has changed, and so are those fighting it. The Metropolitan Police will soon move out of its iconic headquarters here, at New Scotland Yard, into a much smaller building just around the corner. In a way, it's symbolic of the cuts, the pressures facing the police at the moment, trying to do as much as they can with a lot less money. But among senior officers, there's no pretending that life will ever be quite the same again. So will the threshold for investigating certain crimes rise? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. And people weren't like that? Well, I, I, I think people are far more... Under, when they know the scale of the challenge, when they understand the choices that are having to be made, I think people understand it. I think it's going to be very, very tough. And I think other things need to change. One of the initiatives we're looking at is whether every police force should do the full range of policing capabilities are the more efficient ways to be organised. Another thing that uh, comes up from time to time is whether in fact we need 43 forces in England and Wales, whether in fact it would be cheaper to have fewer forces. Police demonstrating about cuts. Now they are braced for much worse. In next month's comprehensive spending review, budgets will be slashed by 25 to 40 per cent. The winds of change are already blowing through forces across the United Kingdom. Many police stations have been shut. Others will be soon. Figures obtained by Newsnight under Freedom of Information give a snapshot of how life on the front line of policing is changing. Over the last five years, the Met has closed 77 police stations. In Merseyside, they've closed 28. Another seven will go. The Police Service of Northern Ireland has shut 29 police stations from a total of 83, and in Scotland, they've closed 31 police stations. In terms of Bobby's on the Beat, um, it's a difficult one because um, it's one of those features of policing which the public have come to like and respect over many, many years. But in fact, the evidence would say that random police patrol doesn't prevent crime, it doesn't solve crime, it doesn't in fact make people feel safer. Are the days of the routine patrol over? I think in the future we will always respond to the pub fight, to domestic abuse, to people in difficulty. Um, and we will always focus our patrol on crime and disorder hotspots. What we won't be doing, I think, is focusing patrol on areas where there is little crime and little disorder. Just after 11 o'clock on a Saturday morning at Piccadilly Circus. Well, if you want 10 minutes with a London policeman, you've caught me just right. By law, police officers have always been protected from the perils of compulsory redundancy. But now police chiefs believe they could be necessary. You don't know port numbers. In a classroom today, seasoned detectives learning new tricks. There's another operating system inside Windows which might be doing bad things. They're being taught how to look for the telltale signs of crime online. Cyberspace is a smoke and mirrors world, and according to one officer on this course, the police are playing so catch-up. One... They all involve communications data, whether that be IP addresses or phone numbers. 
for us to resolve those IP addresses and phone numbers is very resource intensive and the Met is grinding to a halt under the weight of um, applications and our ability to process those applications quickly because they're not cheap to do. Money's short and the police need help. I think we'll have to look at completely different models. There's been a lot of talk as we, as we start to step into this world. Why could we not work with industry to fund some of the work we do? And they can help in paying for that. Does that mean direct funding for some of your programmes? Potentially. And I think, actually, I think that's one of the things we're going to have to think about as we go forward. Now, there are all sorts of ethical challenges and hurdles along the way. But one of the things a challenge of this size and scale does is force you to think differently. But the future does offer one nod to the past. Are you a Miss Marple? The police well, need you. Know. DIY it's detectives really are back. Would you encourage people to be more proactive in, investing, in investigating certain types of crime for themselves and then helping you by delivering what evidence they have? Absolutely, you know, so take, a, take an example of, of, of your home. Many people now will have a CCTV or something uh, on the outside of their home and those sorts of things. You know, their alarm might go in the middle of the night. Um, they would look at their CCTV and if there's something on there, give it to us. There's been a lot of commentary when we've talked over the last six or 12 months about people looking on auction sites themselves, you know, prize bikes stolen from shed and go on auction sites. I'm probably the only person who'd recognise my bike. If I asked someone to describe it, I'd say, well, it's red and it's made by X. You know, absolutely getting people involved and the whole notion of uh, people being active in that crime prevention work, in that crime detection work with us, has got to be part of the future. The Home Office insists frontline services have been protected and crime is coming down. They say it's how officers are used that matters, not how many of them there are. But for those in uniform, the thin blue line is getting increasingly threadbare. Nick Hopkins reporting there, a lot of provocative ideas in that piece. Joining me now, Joanne McCartney, Chair of the Police and Crime Committee on the Greater London Assembly, and the sociologist Dr Janet Foster from the London School of Economics. Good evening to you. Look, let's go through some of these ideas. Let's start with Bobby's on the beat. It's interesting to hear someone say, look, they're really not doing anything at all. So it, it does sound like they're a first cut on the block, no? No, I think Bobby's on the beat play an important role in reassuring the public and also, also increasing public confidence that there is an officer there that can help. I mean, you know, the cuts that policing is facing now is taking us back to 1970s level funding. Um, and I don't think any of us just want to see police in cars driving around and swooping when there's an issue, but not actually right. being there engaging but with communities we, we to start with. Really want them to spend the money wisely and yep. efficiently and rationally. And if they don't prevent crime or catch crime, then Bobby's on the beat is just one of those romantic luxuries we perhaps can't afford. Them. Well, I think Bobby's on the beat are important. You know, they, they are the mainstay of our um, traditional policing. But obviously, it's how you use those. Bobby, so that you make sure you use them, for example, in crime hotspots. You know, they, they, you know, so I think there is a need for them. And of course, you know, increases of traditional crimes, such as violence and street based crimes, are actually going up in the city. They're not, they're not coming down. So that those traditional crimes are still there, but the demand on policing is expanding as new crimes are coming to the fore. Janet Foster, do you, would you put much money into Bobby's on the beat, this famous? No, I probably wouldn't. I mean, the research evidence, and Sarah Thornton says it is in the, in the package, that the important thing is, is that, that the research evidence suggests that um, it doesn't actually reduce crime, having bobbies on the beat. But there is an important element of public reassurance in terms of reducing fear of crime. The interesting thing, though, is, is that fear of crime is sometimes higher in areas which have very, very low rates of crime, so i.e. the visibility might not be in the places where you need to have police officers the most. Mm -hmm. However, the experience of neighbourhood policing over the last 10 years or 15 years has actually showed that having some kind of visible presence in communities um, is actually quite important in terms of how people feel. Right. But with limited resources, what we need to do is, is we need to put the cops where the problems are. Right. But, but of course, we've also heard from the police that actually community policing and having local people 
Bob is known to local people means that they get valuable intelligence which actually they are in danger of losing if they throw out neighbourhood policing altogether. Is that, that evidence-backed that up, Jan? Yes, absolutely. And the important thing is, is to remember that the public are the eyes and ears for the police mm. and that they are the conduit by which the police learn about crime and the interactions that police officers have and the better the relationships okay. with communities, the more likely you are to get... Uh, Clearly agree. Good. Nice to have maybe not on the scale that you would want it if you don't have the money to do everything. Uh, can we look at some things that were perhaps, you know, the public would say they would like to happen before they lose bobbies on the beat? Um, Joanne, we've been discussing merging police forces for, I, I can't, for as long as I can remember. Yeah. Everyone, everyone recognises it would save money, and, and, and yet it never happens. Why doesn't that happen? I think it's not popular with the police forces themselves. Is it literally that? Maybe, and of maybe course, they should just Now we it. have a system of elected police commissioners, I can't imagine them wanting to abolish their own positions, which is what would actually be needed. I mean, in London, um, we operate on a borough command unit. You know, each London authority um, borough um, has its own command unit. But that's one of the proposals about scrapping that and perhaps having one commander in charge of two or three of those boroughs. So those proposals are being looked at. Janet, is any, any view on that one? I think, um, I, I think there are a whole series of uh, issues and difficulties that yeah. are related to, to <laughs> these things. Sorry, just remind me what the question was well, again. No, about, about merging police forces. Yeah. And, I, I think actually it's to do with the politics of the okay. issues um, and that, that, that the politics and policing are something actually that don't mix very well but all the time the political decisions are driving certain kinds of um, decisions about policing so for example the whole emphasis on police numbers is something that is a politically driven thing that looks at policing as being about crime fighting in a very narrow form right. and so obviously the public, it makes because sense. the public clearly think numbers is the best single sort of snapshot snapshot of what you would want in a police force absolutely and the public are just a bit absolutely it's a bit simplistic for yeah. the public to think that however i think if we look back at the 2011 riots and um, we will see that police numbers did play important mm. but, but can we, we lose 8000 i mean you know 8000 sounds like in, in, in a force the size of the yeah. met that's just that's about a quarter. London, that is about a quarter. Yeah, yeah. It seems impossible you could contemplate that without re-engineering the whole idea of what the police are doing. Absolutely, and I think probably the really important thing to consider here is, is that what you've got is, is that you've got all the backroom functions have already been taken away and cut as far as possibly they, they probably can be cut. And the irony of that is, is that in some of those services are things that actually would deliver more effective and efficient policing um, but uh, you know the scenario has been that you needed to focus on police numbers mm. but we've certainly got to the stage now where it's frontline policing that's going to be hit and it's in our all our best interests to have a safe and secure um, situation mm. and the interesting thing as you said in your introduction is, is that the focus has been on health um, ring fencing health, ring, fen ring fencing education, and yet actually policing is a vital service. Do, 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 I mean, Joan, do we need to rebase expectations? At the moment, basically, if something goes wrong in the street, somebody has a nervous breakdown, strips yeah. all their clothes off and runs naked or something, you, you would basically think we call the police. You know, that yeah. would be your... F <laughs> that's yeah. just who you would go to. They are the state, really. Yeah. Do we yep. just have to stop thinking that the police can do all that stuff? If, if, if I think we do, and I think there's certainly some work going on at the mo moment to understand what the level of police demand is. I mean, uh, um, I think the Met say that between 15 and 20% of all their work is to do with mental health um, issues, and that's not part of their core policing. But as you say, um, you know, if you saw someone in distress, you'd call the police. I think this is, you know, there's a perfect storm gathering over policing because they are the emergency service of the last resort. And with cuts to local authority budgets, cuts to um, health service um, and to the voluntary sector, um, who's going to pick up the pieces if the police don't? Mm. Actually, I think what's important here is, is that we fundamentally misunderstand what the role of the police yeah, is. So all of these functions yeah. um, that are now, for example, yeah. dealing with mental health issues, dealing with all kinds of order maintenance issues, which aren't necessarily to do with crime. But the important thing that we need to do is, is to understand what it is that the police do. And I think the political agenda has been about policing as crime fighting. So actually the police have always done a multiplicity of tasks, many of which are fairly thankless that they don't particularly enjoy themselves but they are, as yeah. you say, the agency of last resort. We'll have to 
have this discussion yes. when we know exactly what the cuts are. Thank you both very much Thank indeed. You.